Joining us now is Ojinika Ojiokwe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Ojinika. Good morning, Dr. Good morning. Bati. How are you this morning? Good, Good morning, Ayo. Good morning. Perfect. Good morning, Rufai. Cheers. Let's get right into it. Well, all right. Good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United States, former President Donald Trump was charged late Monday with attempting to overturn his 2020 election loss in the state of Georgia. He and 18 others have been indicted on counts that include racketeering in a 41-charge document issued by a Fulton County grand jury. District Attorney Fannie Wills says arrest warrants have been issued for Trump and others charged. The indictment marks the fourth time Trump has been criminally charged this year. He is now facing 91 criminal charges. In Myanmar, at least 30 people are missing after a mudslide at a jade mine in the northern mountainous town of Paknat, home to the world's biggest and most lucrative jade mines. Many of the victims are believed to be locals digging through the mud along the cliffs, many of whom work and live in abandoned mining pits. At least 162 people died in a landslide in the same area in July 2020, while an accident in 2015 left more than 110 dead. In Nigeria, the Chief of Army Staff Torid Lagbaja on Monday assured Nigerians that the military will continue to confront security challenges in the country. The army chief gave the assurance when he inaugurated the army's newly constructed headquarters of the 8th Division in Sokoto State. Lagbaja also called on Nigerians to support the troops with actionable information in their battle against criminals. As soldiers, as professionals, as disciplined soldiers, you must remain apolitical. Is that clear? Yes, sir! Your loyalty is to the government and the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Honor Sports, the First Lady of Nigeria, Senator Oluremi Tinubu, hosted members of the Super Falcons at the presidential villa in Abuja on Monday, a week after their ouster from the ongoing 2023 Women's World Cup. The Falcons crashed out of the tournament following a 4-2 loss on penalties to the Lionesses of England. Remy Tinubu's reception of the Falcons comes after she hosted Nigeria's women's basketball team, D Tigress, following their fourth consecutive women's Afro basket title. It is with great pride and joy that I celebrate the Super Falcons and your remarkable journey to the FIFA Women's World Cup in Faraway, Australia. Finally, on our entertainment, multiple Grammy Award-winning artist Beyonce Knowles has made history with her ongoing Renaissance World Tour after it became the highest-grossing tour by an African-American woman. The tour, which is halfway done, has already amassed over $296 million. The tour features Beyonce and her 11-year-old daughter, Blue Ivy, whose dance choreography to the hit single, My Power, has gone viral. I love Blue Ivy. I mean, congratulations oh, yes. to Beyonce. Yes, She's she set to make about $500 million from that tour. Well, okay. let's begin what's trending. The Nigeria Labor Congress on Monday issued a warning that it would mobilize its members to embark on an indefinite nationwide strike if the current price of petrol increases. Joe Ajero, the president of the NLC, made the statement at the African Trade Union Alliance meeting in Abuja over the weekend. All marketers hinted that the pump price of petrol would rise to over 700 naira per liter if the naira continues to depreciate against the dollar, especially at the parallel market. And NPC, on the other hand, in a tweet on Monday, debunked the claims of increasing their PMS pump prices as widely speculated. Well, here is their tweet on X. Dear esteemed customers, 
we at NNPC Retail Value your patronage, and we do not have the intention to increase our PMS pump prices as widely speculated. Please buy the best quality products at the most affordable prices at our NNPC retail stations nationwide. I am sure you know that this is a big topic because everyone would say, why is it that they are always coming out with these statements? And... I mean, are they the ones that are determining the prices now? No, no, I thought no, that they no, said no, it, was, market market it was market forces. Market forces. I mean, how is it that they That's are... That's why I said what, that they are what stations. <laughs> I mean, so how is that possible? <laughs> but also the fact that NLC is also uh, threatening the strike. Let me take some reactions on that. This is from Crypto, who wrote, Fuel hike. Did NLC go on strike on the earlier fuel hike? The answer is no. And will they carry out their threat to go on strike if fuel prices hiked again? Yet again, the answer is no. Well, Blue Blood wrote, Labor leaders should stop deceiving themselves with strike or no strike. If fuel price goes up, they should rather negotiate good palliatives for Nigerians, especially workers. PMS price is no longer in the hands of the federal government because there is no subsidy again on it. I mean, Ayo. I'm coming to you because, you know, I believe we have a, a few more days before that deadline yeah, ends. Yeah, I think so, the 26th of Is it the 26th so of, for the palliatives? I mean, the Niger coup has been dominating the headlines for, what, about a week now or even more, and we haven't heard from the federal government on what the plan is on palliatives, which is the major, major point here. Before you come, you know that the governor, some governors have taken initiatives, yes. but you know... Borno State Governor has been doing the Lord's work. The Governor of Borno State, Babagana Zulum, took charge of a significant food palliative distribution on Monday. The remarkable gesture was aimed at extending relief to over 10,000 households in Banki Town, situated within the Bama local government area of Borno State. Last week, the Governor distributed palliatives to people of Mafoni community in Maiduguri, in the first round of food distribution targeting 300,000 beneficiaries across the state. Babagan Azulum. All right. Okay, so first of all, well done to the governor of Borneo mm -hmm. State and all the other governors Absolutely. who have made efforts to um, give some form of palliatives to their citizens, to their, to, to the, well, to their citizens. Now, yeah. in respect to that, what we need and what people are calling for is for a more sustainable approach to palliatives or perhaps cushioning the effects of your subsidy removal. And so whilst governors have done in their own little way, in their own mm. ways to give food and all that, it's what the national response to the sufferings of Niger the Nigerian people. We don't want to live from hand to mouth or from one hand out to the other. What people want is a livelihood that is sustainable, which currently isn't happening. Now, going back to the NLC um, um, threatening to, um, that they would wake up one morning and they would down their tools, they would just, you know, cripple the economy as it were. You can understand their grouse. And again, just like the tweet said, what you then wonder is, What's the, this um, threat of strike upon strike? We had the protest on the 2nd yeah. of August. They postponed it after the first and um, second day saying that they had, they were going to give the government a bit of time with the call of the president to exercise more patience. But in the meantime, Nigerians are suffering. I raised this point, and I think about yesterday or two days ago, that we are talking about the Nigerian issue, that we are not speaking about the fact that Nigerians still have a war, a poverty war, and we have a war on poverty to Absolutely. fight here back home. We need to deal with that. It almost seems as if the presidency didn't have a plan on subsidy removal and on coming into in coming into power and the people have to suffer. And at that, we still have the fact that they haven't they're still spending quite lavishly in terms of our leaders. Two million naira or the, the amount of subsidy amount of money two. only. People are saying, oh, why are we making the noise about that? How when can people we not? cannot afford to yeah. eat once a day anymore in yes. Nigeria. We cannot blame people for saying they, in fact it's not even because they have to strike, it's that they can't even afford to go to work. Yes. That's the question we the conversation we'll be having very soon. All right. Because we don't have much time, Dr. Abate, I wanted to come to you in regards to the DSS debunking the story that we took yesterday. They said that they don't have the uh, MD or the MD's brother of Reportera.ng. And it raises a lot of questions here. But let me take Reportera, who de they debunked that tweet as well. They wrote, breaking, we neither arrested Namdi Ibezim nor his brother, Chike Ibezim. DSS affirms a continuous illegal detention of Reportera MD's younger brother, Chike Victor Ibezim. 
Mr. Chike Bezim was abducted on Thursday, 10th August 2023, following a defamation petition filed to the Director General of DSS by Babatunde Fashola, SAN, against Reportera based on a news report published on Sunday, 6th August 2023. I mean, they have come out to say that they are. Chik, uh, Chike is still in detention. That's the DSS tweet. Well, I mean, uh, it's uh, one against the other. Yeah. Reporter is saying yeah. in that tweet that he was abducted. Mm. The question is, who abducted him? Mm -hmm. Yesterday, the story that you brought said it was DSS. Yes. But DSS, exercising the right of reply, has now come forward to say we don't have him in our custody. So, in between the two, the, the truth is there. And I said yesterday, okay, that you can't arrest one person for an offense committed by another person. The other side of it, of course, is that there's something also in law called aiding and abetting. If you're an accessory before or after a crime or a felony, then you can be charged. But in this particular case, what was said was that the man was picked up uh, because uh, his brother had done something. Was he an accessory to the fact? But what I said to date, until we eventually know yes. that truth in between, uh -huh. is that the DSS exercising the right of reply says is not with us. Mm. And I hope that DSS has checked. And if you see uh, the, res the response from uh, Reporter. Uh, Reporter, Reporter, they are saying he was abducted. Yes. So who the, abducted him? So what do you mean by you? <laughs> checked. DSS has checked, no. that's what he said. Maybe, maybe. No, no. To check no, their facilities. No, they have, they, have, they have departments yeah. all over the country. Yeah, they, it's not it, only in Abuja. Is they have DSS yeah, well, is it in every way? state capital. Mm. So if they check all their units, across and they have confirmed that it's not with them, you know, then it's not with them. Right. And Frontier, I have a reporter saying he was abducted. You never know. This is a country of kidnappers. Right. Was he kidnapped? Well. Is it possible that there's no connection with the petition written by Fashola SAN? Yeah. So, you know, we don't know the truth. Right. Okay. So we cannot jump to conclusion. Yeah. All right. Uh, Rufai, we had Don Pedro here earlier. Yeah. I'd like for you to discuss the story. We'll take another story. The feud between the governor of Edo State, Godwin Abaseki, and his deputy, Philip Shwaibu, widened over the weekend after Obaseki accused Shwaibu of manipulating the election of the National Youth Council of Nigeria in the state to further his governorship ambition. The governor made the claims during the celebration of the International Youth Day in Benin City. Godwin Abaseki had earlier alleged that his deputy hatched a plan to kick him out of office. Shwaibu, on the other hand, accused the governor of preventing him from performing his constitutional duties and filed a suit at the Federal High Court in Abuja to prevent an alleged impeachment plot against him. Last week, while addressing stakeholders, Obaseki claimed that Shwaibu had become so desperate to succeed him ahead of the Edo governorship election in 2024. My deputy called a leader, a leader in APC, telling that leader that during the elections the next day of the leadership, speaker, particular speaker of the House of Assembly, that he has five members who are loyal to him and that he would like the several members of APC to work with the five members of PDP to produce a speaker. If the deputy governor had become so desperate to take over that he would do anything, including undertaking, carrying out a coup against his governor. How can you say you are loyal and you don't do that sort of a thing? All right, Rufai, over to you. Dear Governor Baseki and Deputy Governor Shwaibu, both of you should please spare us. Spare us your internal struggles. When you were together, when you were in hot romance, when both of you were doing love in Tokyo, you see Deputy Governor uh, Shwaibu say, oh, my Governor, Governor Baseki is the best man ever. Oh, very lovely Governor. Now, because of power, you can see what's going on. And that's why I asked Mr. Don Pedro Baseki a question I couldn't answer. I said, see, what was the promise made to Mr. Schreiber? Mm -hmm. When Mr. Schreiber was going to go up against Adam Sosherman, mm -hmm. the man that brought him to be deputy governor in the first place, 
You know, he had just won an election to the Federal House of Rep before. And Mr. Shomole said, okay, come and be deputy governor. What were the promises that were made to Mr. Shoaibu that made him hold on so strong to Obaseki and take the risk? Politicians will never tell you when they make all sorts of promises to each other. Mm. But when everything goes awry, they come back and start to tell us and to look for public sympathy. In this case, both of them as guilty as charged. One has finished his tenure and looks and says, okay, this man that was my ride and die before might not be fit for purpose again. That one says, no, I went through the fire with you. We did it together. You remember the days of four plus four, four plus four, four plus four. You can see the way it's ended now. Mm. And I think Nigerians should see this as an instructive it's note. It's a big lesson. It's a big Do lesson. not take these politicians seriously. They are always there for their own benefits. The day it fits them, they'll come together. The day it doesn't fit them, they'll go up apart. But I, I will not be surprised if the deputy governor and all of this in the squares for power reconciles with Mr. Shomole. Mm. And they move things on. But Nigerians should be careful because in this game of chess, these politicians play, we are always the pawn. Right. They'll use us today, they'll give us sweet rhetorics, we'll lap it up like a lap dog, and we vote for them again. When is it going to be about us, the people? You can see them, both of them. Number four. Well, <laughs> the, number four. Well, you see the, them? The trust there is you gone. See them? Absolutely. All right, then we'll take another story. Students of the law department of the University of Calabar on Monday trooped out in protest over alleged sex for grades perpetrated by their department's dean, Professor Cyril Ndifon. The professor was reappointed as dean of the law faculty in 2022 after he was removed over allegations of rape back in 2016. He was also suspended in 2015 after he was accused of sexually assaulting a 20-year-old 400-level student. Well, in the video now making the rounds of social media, the Unical law students were heard chanting and carrying placards with inscriptions like, Law girls are not bonanzas. Stop grabbing us. Tabati, the great Malabite. <laughs> it's unfortunate what's happening in your wow, school. I yeah, know. truly unfortunate. Malabar. It's not just about uh, University of Calabar. It's about the Nigerian education system, the university system. And we've been on this matter for years. You recall that there have been reported cases of sexual harassment in other universities mm. across Nigeria, prompting the Senate of Nigeria in 2012 to adopt what they called a sexual harassment policy document, and then leading in 2014 to the Sexual Harassment Act, mm. forbidding any kind of situation in which female students or male students are harassed or inappropriate gestures are made towards them. And in fact, part of the success of that law is that one university at the University of Ife, as we speak, or rather, Obafemi yeah, University, university, as it is now, is in jail, is in jail yeah. as we now speak. Yeah. But at the University of Calabar, this, uh, you know, distinguished uh, Malabresis, that's what we call the uh, female students of the University of Calabar, are saying that this professor in Diffon, who was removed mm. on allegations of sexual harassment, has now been brought back as a, as a dean of the faculty. And that day, you know, the lawyers in Embryo, uh, they are tired, you know, of being, uh, of being uh, harassed by their dean. Well, I assume that the university authorities will have investigated the allegations leading to his suspension mm. the first time these allegations were made. And that it must have been reinstated because the university authorities could not really establish whatever happened. But I think that the university authorities should take a, another look, now resulting almost into a breakdown of law and order Absolutely. on campus with uh, you know, law students you know, uh, carrying placards and going all over the place. So it's not something the university authorities should treat uh, with uh, levity. They should take a second look at the matter. And Professor Ndifo himself, you know, uh, should uh, know that this is a major stain on his uh, otherwise distinguished career because for him to reach the level of a professor, he cannot just jeopardize everything just because he's uh, uh, allegedly chasing skirts all over the place. Mm. So 
at various levels, you know, it doesn't look good. But the university authorities have an obligation to look into the matter and to ensure that our university campus, you know, uh, does not become a place for, you know, uh, men engaging in uh, cockadry or harassment. But the bigger challenge is across Absolutely. the tertiary level. Even at the secondary school level, I hear even uh, secondary school okay. female students are not safe. You know, so it's, it's unfortunate. Oh. And that's why the law must be applied where it can be established Absolutely. that an infra infraction has occurred. Ayo, how does it make you feel? I'm very upset yes. about this story, really quickly. You know, very quickly, unfortunately, it's not University of Calabada, it's in isolation. And as Doctor mentioned, I hope we can treat or address this issue of sexual harassment across the board in the workplace, in our education um, system, and in different areas, even in, the, in, in, in verbal harassment, sexual harassment, like you mentioned. Some of the students said that he would grab some body parts. He has denied it, though. He said it is an attack from his detractors. It's not mm -hmm. a, I mean, we're not surprised at this. The lecturer at um, the Obafemi Awolo University also denied initially before he was found guilty. I'm hoping the university will take this one very seriously. And very importantly, that these students will not be targeted because they came out to protest, because yeah. there are issues around them being, you know, um, threatened to be suspended. I hope they will not pay or be targeted because they came out to protest against this. Well said. Well, all right. We'll take our final story. Some unidentified soldiers on Monday were seen in a video that has now gone viral, beating up an officer of the Lagos State Traffic Management Authority in the Ojota area of the state. The video is coming after a soldier was attacked by a traffic officer last week. Let's take a look. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I mean, it's very sad in our country, and I'm happy both the military authorities and last month I've reacted to this, men in uniforms, you know, doing all sorts, beating another officer out there. This is extremely very sad. And I, I want the military to be able to pick this man up and then yeah. blindfold and let justice be meted out. We can't have a country where people will do things like this and mm. go to cause for you. Just come, you hurt people. Because, uh, and I'm sure this is in reaction to the video he that played. Yeah, we are, you know, the one we, we played did, last took week. last week, yes. yes. That, well, we don't know, know if that's the uh, But officer. we don't know if that's the, is that the clear officer. officer. But, I mean, it's just sad what happened. Yes, yeah, so this was uh, what really happened initially. Yes. But even this is highly condemnable. Yes. And nothing was done by both authorities. We haven't heard anything. This. I we don't have nothing. any report. Then the other one happened. Yes. It's a shame on us. We can't keep putting this nation to disrepute. It's things like this that chase away foreign investors. Well, all right. I'd like to uh, thank you all. For your great analysis, as always, on What's Trending. Well, that's all I have for you on What's Trending today. I'll see you all tomorrow.